Hey, everybody. Welcome to Scared Awareness Training. Uh, hey, Mike. Yeah. You know, you said you updated the deck. Yeah. Yeah. What year is it? Uh, I was one of the people that updated the deck. <laughs> <laughs> so I want everybody to know that, that we've been Dang like, it. we've been in the holding room, like waiting to start for 20 minutes and... <laughs> Looking right. at this, and looking at this, and making God. sure it's updated. And none yeah. of us saw 2021. That's so, a fail. Okay. Oh, so luckily, I don't have to write any checks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, happy 2021. Uh, this is your security awareness training. Uh, if you are uh, coming because you're getting credit, I promise that will that 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 will say 2022 for your for your uh, for your certificate. We also promise that this is never boring. This is not your grandfather's security awareness training. Um, and uh, you know, quick history of how we got started in this. Do you remember the pandemic? Yeah, back when it was going on. A bunch of organizations that did in-person security awareness trainings stopped doing it because they sent everybody home. Well, so we said, all right, we're going to do this for free for folks. And what happened was we expected 30, 40 people. We've had thousands of people now go through this. And I know for a fact one organization avoided, avoided sending a scammer $300,000 because their accountant came through this. And then just earlier this week, I spoke to a group of hospitals uh, in, in, uh, in Kansas uh, and I got a note from somebody afterwards saying, you know what, I'm going to send my folks to that because that sounds really great. So uh, if you are in the audience, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Um, all right. Stick with us through the whole thing. There are prizes in the end. Um, and also you have a chance where you can you can either ask for your prize gift card or you can donate it to a food bank. Uh, uh, Jenny, who runs our events, is in the chat. I think we donated a couple thousand dollars last year to food banks because people said, "Yeah, give my donation to a food or give my prize to a food bank." Uh, so that's really cool. Being here, you're doing something good for the world. You are learning uh, how to not fall for scams, and you're going to tell all your coworkers and all your friends and your parents and everybody not to not to fall for the scam. Grandparents, yep, not to fall for the scams. And if the scammers stop scamming, well, that's good stuff. Um, and you're, some of you are getting credit for being here. Somebody said to you, Hey, you should go to this. Um, and then they're going to say to us, did they go to that? And we'll say, yes, they went to that in 2021. I'm just kidding. Just kidding 2022. <laughs> um, and then look over in the chat on the right in the chat. Uh, we like to keep it lively. If you were in a room with Mike and you were chatting in the back, it'd be rude, but it's digital. So nothing's rude, just like social media. So uh, in the in the chat, go ahead and put your questions as we go. I'll interrupt Mike. It's my favorite thing to do. It is. Um, also in the chat is Elise Dennis. Uh, she is a social engineering black belt, which means that uh, people hire her to trick their employees into letting her in to the networks to then say to the employees, you shouldn't have done that. Um, she's a social engineer. This is what she does for a living. Uh, if you want to know what that's like, if you have questions, if you have those burning questions, you've always wanted to know, like, hey, can somebody hack into my iPhone and how does like or our iPhone safe? Ask in the chat. She'll answer your questions. Um, and Mike Hamilton, who's the guy on the left there, is the Critical Insight co-founder. He's the former CISO of the city of Seattle. What that means is uh, he ran cybersecurity for the city of Seattle. Um, Mike, oh God, every week I say to Mike, Take out punk drummer. People don't need to know you're a punk drummer. Every week he puts it back in. I want people to buy our album. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Um, and quick history on us. So Critical Insight Cybersecurity Company in Washington State. We have security operations centers, which means that we have people who, well, they used to be in a room together uh, and they um, uh, and they watch networks 24-7. And if a bad guy gets in, they say, aha, and they help you get them out. Um, and uh, And we do all sorts of other stuff like that. Dennis George wants to know the name of your band, Mike. Citizen Z. There you go. Citizen Z. Um, we're, on, Elise, we're on band camp. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Elise is actually an accordion player. And if we have enough time in the end uh, and Mike goes short, she'll come on and play accordion. Right, she's going to do all. a thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, she's going to do a thing. All right, Mike, all yours. All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're, we're glad you're here. Why are you here? Uh, well, you may have records in your company, your government agency uh, that meet the definition of personally identifiable, right? And that's a combination of public and non-public elements of uh, information about someone that in aggregate can be used for financial fraud. 
That's what PII is. If you have that stuff, if you lose it, there's a big price to pay. Uh, customer information, employee information, W-2s, things like that, intellectual property, you don't want to lose that stuff. That's why you're here. That's great. Uh, if you're in the public sector and you handle water purification, waste treatment, traffic management, communications for law enforcement, public safety, emergency management, elections, 911, we're really glad you're here because we live here and that stuff keeps us alive. So thank you for being here. You might be here, as Jake said, because it's an annual requirement that everybody gets some kind of training like this. Um, that's great, too. And as Jake said, we'll give you a certificate that says you took this training or maybe you just heard this was, you know, entertaining and wanted to see what this was. about. We don't care. We're glad you're here. When you walk out of here, hopefully you will have some information that hopefully you will continue to propagate out, as Jake said, to your parents, grandparents, your co-workers, your bosses. Everybody needs to know this stuff. Here's what we want you to take away. Gullibility has consequences. The internet that's out there that you interact with, okay, not the one that's just the backbone, you know, for all the packets moving around. The one that you interact with is trying to sell stuff to you, steal from you, and lately manipulate your opinion. And it's doing that very well. Uh, we have confirmation bias problems in the country. Set that aside. It's another topic. Uh, your credentials for authentication, your passwords are a prime focus for actors right now. Why is that? I can package up some exotic exploit to break into your network and hope that you will bite on the bait that I sent you and hope your system is vulnerable to that. Or if I get you to give me your password, I'm just going to walk in. Okay, That's why your passwords are a special focus here. We're going to hit that over and over. Um, the bait. You need to recognize the bait. And so a lot of this presentation is going to be examples of that bait. And hopefully you burn that into your memory so that when you see it, you go, wow, man, this kind of looks like what that guy said was fake, right? That would be a win for us. Um, and you also need to know that it's not just throwing some, you know, booby-trapped PDF out over the internet waiting to see who's going to bite on it. Now it's targeting They'll go mine LinkedIn and they'll say who reports to who, who handles financial transactions, who has the authority to command a financial transaction, et cetera. All right. So now it's getting more personal. You need to know that. All right. If, if you're any kind of business executive, somebody that manages, uh, here are the things that you really need to know about. Because we're going to go to cyber, 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 right? Cyber is a dumb word. It's a cartoonified word created by the federal government to make a whole bunch of really complex things condensed into a single word. All right. Well, setting cyber, cyber, cyber aside, here's what you're really trying to avoid. Number one, the loss of protected records. That PII I talked about, can't lose it. There's a cost to that. We know it's about $200 a record to clean it up. Got a million records in a database. You have a potential liability of $200 million. That's the way to think about it. Theft through business email compromise, extortion through ransomware. You want to avoid theft and extortion. You want to ha avoid having your money ripped off. Okay. Also other kinds of theft. You can, you can steal computing resources and something I'll tell you about crypto mining in a minute. You know, your intellectual property. You don't want to lose any of that stuff. And then the third one, the biggie, is just disruption for the sake of disruption. And some of the, the uh, alerts that have been coming out of, of Department of Homeland Security and the FBI are pointing right at that. They are saying, prepare you may be collateral damage from acts by a nation state, Russia, and that might be coming, okay? And that's not going to be trying to extort you for money. That's just knocking you down, all right? And then here's the 21st century bonus bummer. Um, Third-party security, supply chain security, which this is all what everybody's talking about right now. You don't want to be that unlocked window that these actors go after for the purpose of victimizing your customers. There have been examples of this over and over and over. Right? Solar Winds was a big one. The Solar Winds network management software was compromised at the source, sent out to everyone, and all of a sudden, everybody had a back door to bad guys in their network. You don't want to be that company. So these are the things to keep in mind from a business perspective. All right. Let's do just a few definitions here so that we're all talking on the same page so it doesn't sound like secret handshake language that I'm whipping out on you, okay? Ransomware, 
All right, it's extortion. It's extortion. Um, depending on how ransomware is uh, targeted, the federal government is starting to call it terrorism. If you knock down a hospital, you're not a criminal, you're a terrorist. Okay. Well, ransomware is starts like any other security problem. You get some little piece of software on your computer, we call it malware, and that can be directed to do a lot of things. Once that initial beachhead is established, they can say, okay, we have access to this network now, this computer, we want it to send spam. We want it to look around for records to steal. We want to conduct espionage and read everybody's email and see what they're talking about. Or we're gonna lock up their network and extort them. That's what ransomware is. So what happens is they get in the network, they look around, they find your backups, they find your critical systems, they lay the bombs, and then when everything is ready, it's a single key push, everything is encrypted, your network doesn't work anymore. And then everybody's screen has the ransom demand on it. That's how it works, okay? And it's starting to show up all over the place in all kinds of permutations. Medical devices, oh my God. Even more disturbing is ransomware as a service. You don't, you don't have to be a sophisticated criminal that is really good at coding in 17 languages to pull this off. You can do it with a credit card, right? That is a very dangerous thing that is very likely uh, going to cause a serious uptick in cyber activism, right? I want to I want to knock down a company that I don't like, all right? Well, you bring down a ransomware attack on it just by contracting it with bad guys. That's bad. Now, remember, it starts the same way as everything else, right? Which is why we're talking to you now. Most of the time, it is a user action that lets something like that into the network. So when you give up a password, okay, or you click on something that came in from someone you didn't expect, you don't know what it is, and you go, well, I'll just have a look at that. You're doing it wrong, okay? And that can start, as it says, a very bad series of events, stealing records, extorting you, knocking down your network because you were curious. Business email compromise. This is a $2 billion a year problem in the United States. It's got a variety of permutations. On the low end, I send you an invoice. You might pay it, right? I'm, I'm a company you've never heard of, or I'm masquerading as a company that you have heard of, and maybe you'll just pay that invoice. Kind of the middle tier is the CEO sends a message to someone and says, I'm at a conference. Uh, I need you to buy me some gift cards so that I can give away to our customers or our prospects, or um, I need an emergency wire transfer done. Okay, well on the high end, somebody will uh, uh, break into the email system of a customer of yours, and they will surveil that email for a while, figure out how these transactions work, and then they will send email as that customer and say, hey, we have changed our bank and here's our new routing number. And if that is not verified, all of a sudden payments are starting to go to the wrong place. So again, a $2 billion problem. And I'll, I'll just give you an example of this. It happened to the city of Seattle not long ago. Mary's Place is a homeless shelter for women and kids. Mary's Place had their email system compromised. We went in, we were helping them clean it up. While we were underway, while all that confusion was going on, whoever was in their email system had the city of Seattle redirect payments to Mary's place and they didn't find out until $800,000 were gone. So anytime somebody says, you know, I want you to change this information, it's got to be verified. It's got to be verified. And you don't verify it by calling the number on the email. You go to the original contract and look up that contact information and use that and verify, are you changing your bank account? All right, we'll show some examples of this. All right, here's one more, cryptocurrency mining. People have heard about this. They might not know exactly what it is. Crypto mining starts with a piece of malware, just like everything else. But what it wants to do is not steal your records, not encrypt your network. It's using the CPUs on your computer to mine cryptocurrency. What does that mean? There's a cryptographic algorithm that needs to be solved, and it takes a lot of computing power to do that. And once a solution is found, that creates a coin, and the miner gets paid for that coin. All right. It's, you know, if power is cheap, you just go rack up computers where the power is cheap and you do it that way. Um, this uses, by the way, an enormous amount of power. Um, if 
power is expensive or you just don't want to go rack up your own computers, you can use existing networks of compromised computers all over the world and buy access to them and put them to work doing cryptocurrency mining for you. Okay, What does it do? It slows down your computer. Things stop working. Computers can actually get seized up and reboot, go into reboot loops and things like that. Um, interestingly, it is becoming legitimized. And so uh, recent news, uh, Norton antivirus software mines cryptocurrency. It's a piece of software you buy to put on your computer so that it will stop viruses and, you know, all kinds of malware coming in. And when it's not doing that, it's mining cryptocurrency and you can opt out of that. The default is to opt in. So this comes and goes depending on the value of cryptocurrency. Right now, cryptocurrency has lost a lot of its value. So this problem may be not as significant in the near future. Okay. All right, there's just a few terms we're going to talk about. When I said it all starts the same way, I'm going to give you a couple of permutations of this. Number one, they can actually break into your network, right? These are all examples recently of things that were used to break into networks. Well, what are these things? They are vulnerabilities. Let me describe an example of vulnerability. Long time ago, a person wrote a program called SendMail way back in the Unix days. Send mail was to send and receive mail, not as a client, not what you type into, but it's the server that goes, I need to contact the mail server out there for the recipient, or I will accept incoming mail from all over the world. Okay. And so when this person created this program, he said, you know, I need a variable here for sender address. Sender address will never be longer than 255 characters. So I'm going to allocate 255 characters of buffer space for that variable. Okay. What happens at character 256 or 418 or 752? That's called a buffer overflow. And if you do it just right, if you get that offset just right, you can punch any commands you want into the running stack of the computer. So there are all kinds of ways that uh, uh, buffer overflows, configuration errors, other types of vulnerabilities occur. So what's the, the take home message here? You got to patch your stuff. Okay, it, everybody talks about this, right? It's the updates, the patches, the vulnerability management. Those are the words that we use to talk about how we manage this stuff. So if you're a home user, even if you're a, a business, Microsoft is going to tell you, I've patched myself. It's time to reboot, right? If you look down at the right-hand side of your tray, if you're on a Microsoft system right now and you see a little orange dot, it means you're behind in that reboot. You need to reboot. Um, you might want to do that right now and come back or maybe after we're done. Uh, your iPhone will get nasty with it. It'll say, hey, reboot me. Reboot. Me. For, forget it. I'm going to reboot in the middle of the night. You don't have a choice anymore. Android and Linux, you have to modify the uh, um, the settings to make sure auto update is turned on. Now, if you're on an IT team and uh, the log4j vulnerability comes out or the exchange vulnerability comes out and everybody in the world is vulnerable to this thing, you need to drop what you're doing. This has just become the most important thing to you. It needs to be treated like an incident. And we have not exhausted the possibilities of all the things that can go vulnerable. And there's going to be more of these global things going on. So heads up, treat this as an incident. That's really good advice. In fact, Fred Langston, uh, our EVP of consulting, wrote a paper on why this should be treated as an incident. Maybe that's a good thing to uh, grab from our site if you're interested. Okay, so that was breaking in. You're breaking into your computer. Number two, somebody can roll over a compromised website. Well, what's a compromised website? This is a log message that we got from a web server from the Seattle Public Library. We were getting calls from people who had gone to that website in order to find their local library branch. And all of a sudden, everybody's computers are acting weird and compromised, and they started to complain. So we went over there and checked it out, found this in the log file, okay? Now, you're looking at this, and what you notice is there's no characters in there between zero and F. So you're thinking to yourself, hey, Mike, this is hex encoded, obviously. Hex decoded, okay? All right, well, here it is, hex decoded. So when we hex decoded this, here's what we found, and you notice what's in red there. What this means is when you go to, back then, when you went to the Seattle Public Library site, looked up your local library branch, got a nice map with the little pins on it, you were getting a present from China on the side 
knowing nothing about it, right? Why did this happen? Because this site was injected. What does that mean? When you interact with a, a, some web application, the only way you do it is through form fields. The only way you can talk to that application is through a form field, okay? And if it's a mature, well-designed application, what it does is when you input something there, it grabs it and says, wait a minute, let me check this out. Anything weird in here? Is this what I expect? Does it look like any kind of an attack here? Okay, database, give me the stuff they asked for. If it is not a mature, well-designed site and doesn't do something called server-side input validation, which is what I just described, you can put direct structured query language commands into that form field and talk directly to the database. You can make it barf up its entire contents or worse, you can inject something into it so that the next person that comes by gets the little present on the side. 200,000 sites a day all over the world are compromised this way. If I asked you, what do you think is the, the most dangerous site that you could go to? What type of site would be the most dangerous for this kind of thing to have happened to smack you when you went there? You probably would not guess that it's a church. Why? Because especially small churches, their web apps, their websites are designed by volunteers who don't know anything about server side input validation and 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 the the OWASP top 10 things that go wrong with web apps. So keep that in mind. The more that you dance around and click on URLs, the more likely you are to run into this thing right here. Here's what it does in the background. This is real data. This is a couple of victims here on the left that went to these sites 31.11s over here and immediately the redirect happened. And it redirected them to all of these six sites here, including Macedonia. Who knew Macedonia was a hotspot for cyber criminals? Now we know. So this is what's happening underneath when you hit an injected site. Okay. And then number three, credential theft and abuse. And I will say the one thing I'm leaving out here is you clicked on a booby-trapped attachment. Because in a lot of ways, booby-trapped attachments are laundered out these days. Um, and we are going to cover those. So... Uh, this is data from Microsoft, and you can see the rise in sites that are phishing sites. Okay, what's a phishing site? It's designed to look like a Microsoft login page, a SharePoint login page, a box.com login page, a DocuSign login page, whatever. And it's trying to get you to enter your password so that they can find out where else that can be used. Okay, the rise in phishing sites corresponds to a drop in sites that directly push malware onto you. And there's plenty of them out there, all right? But what does this tell you? It tells you that the control that will reliably fail is the one between your ears. It's a whole lot easier to trick someone than it is, again, to package up some exotic exploit, make all of this happen, right? Yes, your computer can be attacked. It can be vulnerable and unpatched, and that can be exploited. It's a whole lot easier if you just tell me how to walk into your network, lay the bomb, light the fuse, and wait. How uh, uh, another way that credentials are abused is this called credential stuffing. So uh, you know that there have been lots of uh, data breaches, and a lot of those involved passwords. Most of them are these PII records and medical data and things like that. But a lot of them they steal passwords. And so, for example, when Yahoo was going through an acquisition. Uh, it came to light that they lost a billion passwords, which uh, affected their valuation immediately. So again, from a business perspective, that's not good brand value. Uh, if I have a billion passwords, and we actually do because we have the Yahoo and other password dumps, I can start to log into your O365 or your network or your VPN or your whatever using every password in that billion, trying it with you. And by the time they get to, I don't know, 200,000, they got gotcha. you. Right. I mean, there's a infinite number of passwords that could be created. There's a finite number that are the top, you know, I don't know, thousand, two thousand, five thousand, something like that. And if you look at what some of the top ones are, they're still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am not kidding. OK. And if that's you, you're doing it wrong and you need to stop watching me right now. Go change your passwords. All right. Another way that credential stuffing happens is they'll do a low and slow attack. So I have a billion passwords. You have 500 users. I'll use password number one with all 500 users. Didn't work. I'll try password number two. 
all 500 users in a row. One, two, three, four, five. Didn't work. Again, by the time I get to password 769 or whatever, I'm going to get a hit, right? And then I am in your network. I can start to surveil. I can escalate privileges. I can start doing all kinds of things, right? This one is of value to criminals because, again, it's low and slow. So if I'm doing it user one, user two, user three, and then start over, no one has three password failures in five minutes and no one gets logged out of the network. No one calls the help desk, okay? Right? Don't reuse passwords. Do not. Because if you use a password with Yahoo for a Yahoo email account and you're using that same password everywhere else, that is known to the criminal community. Don't reuse passwords. And we'll talk more about password management later. All right. So there's the ways that your network, your computer get compromised. Here's some of the ways that they're trying to get you to let them in. All right. So no. Companies do not pay you for your opinions. There is no such thing as the European lottery or the Microsoft lottery. No, it's all fake. Gullibility has consequences, right? Um, this is designed to gain personally identifiable information from the victim. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, boy, it looks too good to be true. So CBS Farm, uh, it's, you'll get three hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty dollars for working twenty to thirty minutes. Does that sound credible to you? No, that does not sound credible. On the face of it, you should reject this. But your parents and grandparents may not. People who didn't grow up with technology think they're being told the truth all the time. You are not being told the truth. The internet is not a nice place. Okay? Don't click on stuff like this, especially because it came from somebody you don't know and it wasn't expected. Your whatever has expired, right? This one's coming around a lot, right? So Norton, they say, well, you know, you're, and, and again, parents, grandparents, they don't know what came on that computer. It, it When you buy a computer, it is so loaded up with junk who knows what's on that thing? Like, oh, no, my antivirus is expired. I got to buy it. All they're doing is collecting credit card information with this, right? You probably don't even have Norton by Symantec on there. Free offers. So, again, you're not going to get paid, you know, for giving your opinion. No. And when it's combined with this, you know, sense of urgency, oh, no, there's only nine left. Really? How long has it been since that email was delivered? And when you finally read it, and how long do you think it would take nine to go away, given this has probably gone out everywhere, okay? This is not real. It is not real. I have uh, uh, redacted the two here, uh, but this actually did come to somebody who has taken this, this uh, uh, security awareness training. And we encourage all of you, if you have good examples, Send them over because we'll work them into this. We want to constantly be, you know, keeping this as fresh as possible. And so, and here's an example. Thursday, January 27th, and I did a horrible redaction job there, 2022. Okay. This is fairly recent. This one is making the rounds a lot too. And uh, it will continue to make the rounds because it continues to work. You've successfully paid for this Bowflex or this whatever, right? It's, oh, no, no, I didn't. I better call that number. They're going to get your credit card, right? That That's what this one is about. So <clears throat> when you see something like this and they're saying, did you really pay for this? And I'll show you another bank example in a minute. These are generally fake. And if there's a way to verify it without using the information in the message, verify it that way. It's not likely that this ever happened, but like check your credit card statement. That would be the way to check it out, right? Okay, COVID bait. When there is something that has uh, uh, increased anxiety for everyone in the world, it's really useful as bait. So tell me, does the World Health Organization know your email address? Does the World Health Organization spell safety wrong? In the subject of the message, no. There are tells here that you can see. There's misspellings. There's bad punctuation. There's grammatical things in here. But does the World Health Organization 
know your email address? Do they know you? Is there any reason they would reach out to you personally? No. Okay. Here's when we, when the, when the apps started to come out, right? So uh, uh, you have an app on your phone and it will notify you if you've been in close contact with somebody that has tested positive. When they, when those apps started to come out, we knew this is going to get gamed. This is absolutely going to get gamed. Well, this is a text message. It did not come over one of those apps. Okay. Your first reaction, again, I got a text message from somebody I don't know. It did not come over the app that I've installed in my phone. If you did install that app on your phone, this is fake. This is fake. The biggest tell of all is I didn't expect this and I don't know this person. What that usually means is you're one of 100,000 people that got that. All right. Anytime, anytime you get a communication from a bank, you've got to check it out independently. It has to be verified without using any of the data in the message. Okay. Dear customer, you know what? Does Chase Bank know your name? They probably do, you know, and they probably have enough resources to be able to customize messages like this and use your name regardless, regardless. Anytime you get something from a bank that says, we need an action of you. You've got to independently verify that or do what I do, ignore it because I know it's fake. All right, here's another one. All right, this is another one. It's like the uh, uh, the Bowflex variant here. Um, did you do these? Okay, first of all, your bank would not tell you this. Your credit card company would tell you this. If you have a Chase Visa, it's Visa that will tell you this, not Chase. All right, this is fake. And ordinarily, they don't reach out and say, did you really do this? What they'll do is they'll deny it if they think it's if, if it's fishy. OK, so what do you think is going to happen if you click on either one of those buttons? It's going to pop up and ask you for your Chase Bank password. What are you going to do? You're going to stop. Look very hard at the information in front of you. Remember this training. Delete the message and move on. Okay, here's an example of business email compromise. This actually came to me, okay? So it did come from Garrett Silver, our CEO, who is not chief underscore exec dot officer one at AOL.com. I don't know who's dumb enough to think that that was actually going to fool me, but here we are. Criminals are not the brightest in the world. All right, I'm arranging some gifts for the staffs, okay? Staffs is a grammatical construct that's not generally used in the United States like it is in the UK and India and some other places, okay? All right? So even if you missed the fake email address, you should remember the training that you took where the guy, that guy said when we get asked for gift cards by the CEO, that's fishy. Yeah, this is fishy. So we get these all the time. You probably get these all the time. These get serious after a while, and I know of people who have been victimized by, by things that are this primitive. Okay, it's not just email. It's coming in other places too, okay? Dear Facebook user, right away, right away, that should tip you off, right? Now, I ditched Facebook a long time ago because I'm not having it with a creepy tracking and all that, but here's what I remember. Facebook knows your name. Dear Facebook user, big red flag, flashing lights right there. What do you think happens when you hit update? It's going to ask you for a password. What are you going to do? Stop, look real hard at this, and move on because it's fake. It's not just Facebook. It's Twitter. All right, look at the one on the left. See the URL there at the top of that browser, right? That's actually called uh, domain squatting there. What they do is they will register a domain that looks kind of like uh, a, a real domain and they'll use that because if you look at that fast you might not see it all right so again something is asking you for a password look very hard at the information in front of you you see it right there look at the one on the right it's using a bit of an implied threat here all right you were copyright infringement was detected one of the tweets in your oh no i'm gonna get sued well you can appeal that by doing what Go to sites.google.com. What? Hi, dear user. Twitter knows my handle. All right. Fake, fakety, fake, 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 written all over it. 
attached. Wait, I gotta voice. stop you. That's a new one. Fakety fake fake fake. Yeah, you want to work that in every time, or are you going to reject that one? I, first, we got to figure out how to spell it. But okay, keep going. Okay. All right. Here's email. Right, a forwarded email. This is probably malware attached here that somehow made it through the email system. All right. Look real hard at what's going on here. All right. Maybe you know somebody at Texas.gov, right? I mean, I, I actually do. Uh, look at who that's to. All right. That does not look like an email address that would map to anybody. Um, you missed a call. Look at the body of the message. You missed a call from 077 through 077. Isn't that the country code for Nigeria? I'm not calling Nigeria back. When you get voicemail as an attachment, it is immediately suspect. One thing that you can do is you can take an attachment like this and you can save it to your to your disk okay and if your antivirus doesn't freak out okay well that's a good sign but then you upload it into something called virustotal.com virustotal.com will pass 60 virus checkers over it and see what anybody knows about this thing so if you get something like this you suspect it might be real maybe you do use ring central i don't know who anybody that does but people do run it through virus total first Assure yourself that this is actually the real deal. Most of the time, it's fake. This is a, a, a an increasingly common tactic, the fuzzed out document behind a login screen here, right? So if, if you're one of the uh, 1.5 people that still has an Adobe Docs security password, don't give it up here, right? Okay, here's fake Dropbox. All right, so Terry McMakin. I don't know Terry McMakin. What's pocketinet.net? And look who it's to. It's to nobody. Well, what does that mean when it's to nobody? Or, or it says to recipients. What that means is everybody's on the BCC list. This went out to tens of thousands of people. They don't know who you are, right? You can delete this and move on. When it says download documents, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to ask you for your Dropbox login, okay? Stop. Look carefully at what's in front of you. Who is it to? I don't know, Terry. I didn't expect this. Do invoices.pdf seems awful unspecific. Delete. Move on. You have a new capital N file sent to you via share dash point. Nobody calls it share dash point, okay? So first of all, this has got mistakes in it. Second of all, who's it to? It's to nobody. Received message, fax 9860. Okay, so what, a 1998 call with a fax that I somehow did, didn't pick up? No, fake, delete, move on. This is happening a lot. Um, this has been happening on Instagram and some other things where uh, an account will get taken over. Why? Because somebody picked a crappy password, made it easy. <clears throat> I do know Kelly Bannon. This did come to me. And that's all it says. Michael, here's a link. Kelly. Well, I do know Kelly Bannon. She's not kelly.b at polychrome.lk, whatever that is. Right. But remember, this is a tactic right now. They'll take over an account and then they'll use it to send out to everybody in their address book and their directory trying to propagate this and roll it forward. And when they get somebody else, they'll do it to their address book. These are all over the place. If you've seen these, you know how irritating these are. Delete. Move on. Uh, here, here are some attachments that are actually malware. So when something comes again, kopera.no. Don't know who that is. Mikal. Don't know. Don't know. This actually did come to my uh, my OG email address that I've had since the late '80s. Mkh and mkhamilton.com. There. Kindly quote the best possible price for the following items at the earliest. Oh, I wonder what those items are. I'm curious. All right. Well, I found out right away by running this stuff through Virus Total that this was really booby trap stuff. Now, I don't know if this went to anybody else but me, but the fact that I'm there called out on the two line means that maybe somebody's coming after me directly, right? And this was not a shotgun blast out over the internet. Always, always beware of stuff. And, and, and there are various permutations of this. You know, hey, we want to buy this stuff from you. It's all fake. All right, look at this one very carefully here. And I'm going to give you a clue. Zoom at securityadmin.net. 
is the only tell that was on here. Okay. Turns out this is a phishing test. I am a, what's called a virtual CISO for a couple of corporations. This was one of them and they do this routine testing. Now, I don't think this testing is that valuable, but this was a real tricky one. And this is why I don't think it's valuable. You trick people into doing this stuff with bait this good. You know, someone just logged into your Zoom account from a new device. Uh-oh. Well, what do you think happens when you hit either one of those buttons? You go immediately to training. So keep this in the back of your mind. Not only are bad people trying to hang bait in front of you, your own company is trying to hang bait in front of you. All right. What was wrong with those? Your real name was not used. Dear Facebook user. Okay. Some of these have a reply to address. If there is any interaction that's being solicited, and I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. And it came from the World Health Organization. And you reply, and it goes to somebody at Gmail. That's called a reply to address, right? That's in the original specification for how email moves around. The use of BCC for all the recipients, where it says nobody on the two line or recipients, or they, they, the, the, the actor will email it to themselves and then BCC everybody else. Grammar and spelling, obviously, but now they're hiring consultants to do a better job uh, with uh, grammatical uh, mistakes and spelling errors. Most of these. If it comes from the outside, especially if it comes from someone that if you're, I assume most people are using Microsoft Exchange for email, Microsoft knows that Garrett Silver, our CEO, is internal to the company. <coughs> Excuse me. So when something comes in, there'll be a big banner because this came from the outside. Don't ignore that. It's a big tell. The biggest one is this. You did not expect any of those. They came out of the blue. You are not that special that somebody out of the blue emails you with an offer or uh, a, a document that you didn't know was coming, anything like that. So if you didn't expect any of these, your radar needs to go up, your spidey sense needs to tingle. All right, a little bit about phones. SIM swapping. This happened to my wife uh, about two months ago. And here's how it works. If I can call T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, whoever, um, and it's, it's actually not... T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T. It's more like cricket and some of the you know smaller companies. <coughs> and the way it works is I can convince somebody at their help desk that I'm you. And I say, right, because I can get enough information, you know, from open sources to credibly emulate someone. And I say, listen, I was on a ferry going across Puget Sound. It's a really great day in Seattle. The mountain's out, so I was taking pictures of Mount Rainier, and I dropped my phone into Puget Sound, and it's 900 feet deep now. I have this new phone, and I need you to connect my old phone number to this phone. That's a SIM swap. All of a sudden, the person who just fooled the phone company is holding your phone. That means everything you use it for, they got it. So... Normally, this is being used to get access to cryptocurrency wallets. So one way to uh, avoid a bad financial outcome is do not have a cryptocurrency wallet associated with your phone. Setting that aside, be aware that this is a thing. And if your phone ever stops working, you need to contact your phone company immediately. If there's no reason and you just don't have any service anymore and you don't know why, you've got to contact them right away because you may have been SIM swapped. And all of a sudden, you've got to start changing passwords all over the place. Yep. Yep. Malware can go from your phone to your PC. Now, this is not common and this is an older news article, but this absolutely does happen. All right. Good thing it doesn't go the other way. Oh, wait. Yeah, it does. Oh, wow. So, uh, again, you know, these are not as common, but what does this tell you? It tells you that a wall charger is a much better thing to use to charge your phone than your work computer, right? Especially with Android. iPhone is a lot more secure than Android. Um, Android under the hood basically is a Linux operating system. Uh, which started out as open source and it's got all the open source problems in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, the apps in particular that you put on your Android device, you may not know exactly what they're doing. And when I say that, there are millions of apps that are removed from the stores 
every year. Um, there are probably thousands every day. So when you are going to put an app on your phone, you need to see how long it's been there in the store, how many times it's been downloaded, how it's rated, if there's any comments about it. Don't willy-nilly just go, hey, here's a game. Well, one was really uh, uh, prevalent was a flashlight app that just compromised just millions and millions and millions of people. This goes on all the time, right? Me, I really keep it to a bare minimum what I really need on my phone, and that's just a good policy removable media uh if you have a high schooler in your house um uh, the uh usb stick that that high schooler may be using to transport information to and from school should be considered toxic school networks are worse than anywhere um we know as a company that does penetration testing is one of the things that we do that if if all else fails and we can't break into your network and we can't entice one of your users to roll over to a, the, the booby trap website we set up or anything like that, we know we'll throw infected USB sticks in your parking lot and wait because that always works. Someone will always pick up a USB stick, jack it into the computer to see what's in there. We get the beacon right away. We know we got gotcha. you. So don't do that. Don't pick up a USB stick you've never seen before and stick it into a computer that's important. Any computer. A dedicated device is really the best one to use. And again, if you have kids and they're using USB sticks for school, don't let those anywhere near any computer of any importance at all. All right. This is my favorite part. Miscellaneous threats. And I'm going to have to hurry here, okay? Uh, yeah, okay. Somebody was able to, to breach Cox Communications by socially engineering their way in, okay? And and Alith, who's handling the chat right now, and I hear all the chat going on here, even though I can't see it, she's really good at this. She will get somebody on the phone, on a help desk, claim to have a problem, and say, listen, here's, just, here's a website to go to, and, and read it over the phone while someone types it in. Bam, gotcha. There's all kinds of this social engineering stuff that happens, you know, one of them is this grandchild in trouble, right? I've been thrown in jail in Spain. I need some money, right? You know, whatever, right? Be aware. This is a thing. Advanced fee scams, all right? Also called Nigerian Prince, Nigerian 419. Why? 419 is the penal code in Nigeria for fraud. And this is fraud. Why advanced fee scam? Because they're going to ask you for money continuously after offering you a big pot of money. All right. So here's Sergeant Andrew Chandler, who has millions of dollars in a box of gold. Okay. But doesn't know my name. Wants to give that to me, but doesn't know my name. All right. Look who it's to recipients. If I had engaged, this person would start asking me for money. And it's got lots of permutations to this attack. Right. Here's a guy who said, Hey, I'd like to invest in your company. If we had engaged, which we actually did. When old Godwin Jack here found out what kind of business we're in, he went away really quickly. Um, and I don't know if you know that Mr. Jeffrey Bezos knows me, but goes by Sergeant Ken dot Miller at gmail.com. Okay. Because he's just, he, he, he's really incognito that way. And uh, who's it to undisclosed recipients. All right. All right. So he's got a ATM card with 1.9 million on it. Wants to give it to me. Doesn't know my name. Doesn't have any idea who I am. This went out to tens of thousands of people. I know people that have gotten caught up into this. And after a while, they've given so much money to pay a bribe, to uh, file documents, to travel across the country to have a meeting, to blah, 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 blah. blah. The, the requests for money just keep coming. I've seen people that dump thousands of dollars into this. And after a while, psychologically, they can't quit. Because if they do, they have to admit, I was scammed all along. And they don't want to do that. This is a terrible thing. Don't let people get, tell this to your parents and grandparents. Use of threats. Hey, we're going to arrest you. No, you're not going to arrest me. This is ridiculous, okay? Your outstanding balance was $698. If you pay $300 a day, we'll close this account in full. Lawsuit cost. I didn't even know there was a lawsuit. Look, who's it to? Ace Cash Services. Spray and pray. The BCC has probably tens of thousands of people on it. Easy to ignore. When something is threatening you and you did not expect this thing coming in and you didn't know there was any lawsuit, what is this all about? 
Don't get inquisitive and engage with these people. Do not. Computer support scam. This will pop up and it will say, hey, man, your computer is full of viruses. You better call this number. And what they will do is they will arrange for you to do a thing, which allows them to take over your computer and move the mouse around and run some fake tools. And they'll go, oh, your uh, maintenance contract is expired. You want to buy a new one? That's what it's for. I got funny stories about this one. We, we actually played with these folks pretty hard at one point. It's a funny story. Not today, though. Uh, work at home scams, okay? Be our agent, our secret shopper. First of all, see that website top left right there? Netanya's Business Journal. That site is so fake. And, and this this just this fries my head. In the United States, people do not have good enough media literacy to know when they're looking at pure BS. If you looked at this site, everything on there is this testimonial about this great program. And there's all these fake comments in there. Hey, I tried this. It really worked. You know, man, get a clue. People get some radar. Know what's fake. Know when you're being fed crap. All right. Here's the way this scam works. They're going to send you a check for about 1800 bucks. Here it is. And they're going to say, hey, this is what we want you to do. Deposit the check. Your bank will say it's okay. Go have a meal. Go get a workout at this gym. Write a report on what you thought about those businesses. Then go to Western Union. Keep $300 for yourself. Wire the West away to the address that we give you and write a report on Western Union. Well, if you do that, about seven days later, your bank will say, hey, that was a fake check. The routing number was real so that it could be sent over to the bank. But the bank's going to look at this and they're going to Portland, comma, comma, Oregon. No, that's wrong. Us Bank Corp, not U.S. Bank Corp. Right. This is fake. Fake check. And if you did this, I hope you enjoyed the meal and the workout because you just wired away your own money. All right. Do's and don'ts. You know this had to happen. All right. Remember, lots of websites have been injected. For example, when that thing pops up and it says your computer is full of viruses, okay, that's because that site has been injected. It happens all the time. So if you just go click on every damn thing you have in your personal email because your business email is laundering this stuff out, your wounds will be self-inflicted, okay? And look at that bottom bullet. It's a real good idea for Facebook to live here. Gmail lives here. It does not live on a work computer, right? That way, burn yourself up. Don't take your business down with it, okay? Fake apps, yeah, they track your behavior. They track your movement. They will hit ad networks in the background so that somebody's getting paid for ad access, but you're paying for all that data transfer, okay? The bait, be resistant to the bait. I hope these examples have driven home the internet is a bad place full of bad people who are lying to you, all right? When your company or anybody puts security controls in place, do not circumvent them. When the, when the, when the, when the page comes up and it says, we don't recommend you go past this point, don't be curious and go past that point. Just, just quit, right? When, when there's a big banner saying, this came from the outside, beware, all of a sudden, hey, this might be fake. I'm going I'm to treat this with some suspicion. Don't reuse passwords. Uh, it becomes uh, uh, just an awful pr uh, problem to manage all your passwords. I'll talk about that in a second, but do not reuse them. You can, you can use, if you have a good password, you can use slight permutations of it in places, but don't reuse the same password. Don't leave company un equipment unattended, especially in a trunk of a car under the viaduct in Seattle. Thank goodness the viaduct is gone. That's actually something that happened to one of our sales guys. Uh, Multi-factor authentication. I'm going to talk about this for a second because a lot of people don't understand this. You may think that if you go to your credit union website and you put in your password, then it says, okay, now what was your mother's maiden name? Or what was the name of your first dog? Or what's your favorite car? Or whatever. That is not multi-factor authentication. They're asking you for two things you know. It's almost like two passwords, okay? Here's what multi-factor th authentication is. There are three factors that you can use, and there may be more in the future. Who knows? There are three factors that you can use to prove you are who you say you are. One is something you know. That's a password. Number two, something you have. These days, that's your phone, and they will send a code over the phone. And the fact that you can input that code means I'm holding this phone. I just proved there's something I have along with something I know. 
The combination of those two things is multi-factor authentication. The last one is something you are, like your palm print, your iris prints, okay? And soon, <laughs> your DNA. Um, so that's what multi-factor authentication is. Use that everywhere. I have it set up on my Gmail. I can give you my Gmail password and it will not do you any good because Google will go, you've never tried to log in from this device before. We're sending a code to your phone. I will get it. I'll go, ha ha, nice try. More important than anything, if you see something, say something. If your computer slowed down. Uh, I, I, I was trying to get this invoice and I gave a password to SharePoint and then it just, nothing happened right? Tell somebody. There are people to tell. Help desk. There may be an internal email address you can use for uh, at your business to report things like this. All right. And just a little bit on OPSEC here. So uh, starts with your password. This is a very famous cartoon. It's called XKCD. And uh, after we're done here, uh, you should go right over to XKCD.com and read some cartoons because they're good. This one is famous because it points out the difference between what we've always been told in terms of how to create a good password, make it something that's really hard to remember, okay, with upper, lower, special characters, numbers, blah, 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 okay, got to be a certain length, okay, it turns out that's actually putting a computer to work trying to guess that because it's not very long is pretty easy, okay, even if it's like 8, 10 characters, as opposed to four words separated separated by spaces or the first line of a book or um uh here's the first that, line of a song from no, here's one Z. that i used to, well here's one that i used to use um and if you ever worked at the city of seattle you will know the significance of this but i can't tell you the galley is always at the seattle end of the boat that was a passphrase used for the master decryption key for something I'm not going to tell you about. But that is that is really easy to remember. Okay, correct horse battery staple, probably not a good choice because that one's in password guessing dictionaries now. Okay, multi-factor authentication though and password vaults, last pass, one pass, dash lane, right? These are really good to use. What? You don't even need to know your passwords. You just have the thing, do it for you. It's really great, right? So, again, do not reuse passwords. Really good to use a passphrase. It's really good to use four words separated by spaces. First line of a book, first line of a song, talking about which end of the ferry the galley is on. Okay. OPSEC at home. Okay. This is really more about a little technical sec, but because it's home, I'm calling it OPSEC. So, your home is now part of your business network. If you're working from home and you have to, you know, move traffic back and forth to your business, you are now an exposure to your business. In that context, if your Wi-Fi password is the name of your dog, you're doing it wrong. If your internet router is open to the internet for administrative login from anywhere in the world, like some people set theirs, you have to intentionally set it that way, you're doing it wrong. You really got to be careful about how secure your home network is, how how you treat the physical security of your computers, who's passing around USB sticks. It all has to do with the security of your place of business now. And then finally, when you're in public, don't talk about stuff you're not supposed to talk about in public places. Starbucks is not a good place to discuss company secrets. Uh, if you do get on a, uh, an airplane and you're going somewhere and you got to do some work, one of these privacy screens, they're great. Can't see your screen from the side, from behind, from above, nothing like that. You're perfectly private working on what you're working. And then the free airport wireless. This is called an evil twin attack, and you can see it illustrated right here. You think you're connecting to free airport wireless? No, you're connecting to someone's laptop who's going to collect all your traffic before they pass it on to the real access point. In which case, they will go to work later decrypting your passwords and probably trying to get access to uh, uh, other assets that uh, you can authenticate to. With that, All right. Jake, well, back thank to you. you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm going to try a new thing here. There's a new button in the thing where I can push a button and make you have something pop up on your screen that says take the survey we would really appreciate it if you take the survey believe now, it or if this not had popped up and ask you for a password what would you do <laughs> I'd, I'd give them my username and password mike why 
and my credit card number and my social security number. No, uh, we really we would appreciate it if you took the survey. Remember, a couple of reasons to do that. One, believe it or not, this has gotten better. Yep. Okay. This has gotten better. Um, and it's because of the, the feedback we get from people. Number two, you get to donate to charity or get a gift card yourself for taking the survey. So we'd really appreciate it if you took the survey. Um, and lastly, we really want, and I'm also going to put it in the chat here. We really want to thank you for being here today. Yes. Uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, it's key to our mission. Hopefully it's key to your mission. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, we do have discount codes for two of the password managers. We don't make money on it, but if anybody wants them, email me, jake at criticalinsight.com or put in the survey. Hey, give me that discount code uh, for, uh, I think it's one password and dash lane gave us discount codes. Um, so if that's helpful to you, let us know. Thank you so much for being here. Happy 2021. I mean, 2022. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, and, uh, uh, and have a great, great weekend, everybody. Have a great Bye -bye. weekend.